<coughs> Hi folks, praise the Lord. I haven't been so excited to do a video in a long time as I am now. It's like, <coughs> you know, you, you have somebody who puts something into words that you've been studying for a long time, but they put it into a paragraph or a sentence and you go, that is what I'm trying to say. Uh, Doug Del Tonto on uh, JesusWordsOnly.com He is going through this book. And so a lot of times when Doug started this, this uh, when he started his little series on this, uh, I looked it up and found out the book was only $7. And so I had to buy it because then I can go through it myself. The only problem is the print is so small. I had to go buy glasses at Walmart, magnified glasses to be able to read the thing and stuff. But uh, <clears throat> I'm not for sure what I'm going to title this video yet because I'm still trying to decide here. But I'm not completely gone through this, but I hit a section here that... I really felt that, okay, Father, this is absolutely helping me to understand where I'm at and, and what was wrong with me and why I was misunderstanding stuff and why a lot of people are misunderstanding stuff. See, I'm trying to figure out how to convey information to people to help them to grow to do the first commandment first and then the second commandment. I've have no doubt that our churches today are really working hard on the second commandment but they are completely neglecting the first commandment okay this book here uh, I won't say his whole name but it's uh, Bolliger B-O-U-L-A-N-G-E-R uh, this is a Frenchman who wrote it in 1746 and it was translated into English in 1823 the guy only lived to be like 39 years old, but he was a profound effector of his communities and stuff. And this is basically a reply book. This is a reply book. It's 39 pages in here. To, or he's replying to a letter to somebody who wrote to him about St. Paul. And he has different categories. And I just was blown away. I just literally couldn't sleep reading some of this stuff and I came home from work today so I could type all this out so I could read it to you and you know I have troubles with some of the words and stuff and this guy's sentence structure is not Nebraskan <laughs> or Iowan so sometimes I have to, to watch that but this listen to the very first portions of this and then the very last portions the, the center helps tie it together okay this is out of chapter 15 it talks about deceptions and this is what I really really think is a lot of our problems that was my problem father has tried for years to get me to quit following men quit looking up to pastors quit looking up to people and look to our Yahweh our Heavenly Father okay so I'm gonna read some of these or highlight things different paragraphs that was in there okay Deceptions. <clears throat> By the aid of our faith, we never find anything to condemn in the conduct of those whom we have been accustomed to regarding as saints. We, we, we think people are saints. Their uh, pride, their seductive spirits, they're <laughs> all kinds of things we justify by saying that they are animated with holy zeal in other words in a word a saint may violate with impurity the most sacred rules of morality without his uh, bigoted admirers permitting themselves to criticize his conduct we will overlook stuff because we believe and feel that Paul is in God's word and that everything Paul says is God's word. Even when Paul says something and admits to something, we put him on sainthood stuff and we won't acknowledge exactly what it's saying. 
Saints have always been in the habit of terming the uh, yeah terming of terming those chastisements which they have drawn upon themselves, oftentimes justly, by their disorder, disorder are honored as confessors and martyrs. And we find the Jews and pagans were the most unjust, cruel of men for having treated the Christians, whom they could not consider but as disturbing the public peace. In the same manner as Christians now treat the Jews, heretics, and infidels. Okay, hang in there with me. I know, this is hard. Uh, you have to buy the book. I mean, it's just incredible. Bigots accustom themselves to regard their saints as irreproachable characters. They're irreproachable. They cannot do any wrong. When I grew up, when I, the pastors, or when I became a Christian, or when I went to Bible school, there are certain people that could do no wrong. And even if they did wrong, because I submitted to them, I believed that they were right. Later, some of them even confessed that they had done wrong. Or if they cannot justify their conduct, they say that God has permitted them to sin to humiliate them in order that they may, might have an opportunity of pardoning them. It is thus that every good Christian regards a Branet in revolt against his legitimate, sovereign, and un or an un un super, a monster of cruelty and <laughs> I know I hate this when I do this. Terrible adultery and assassin. In one word, this will explain it. David, King David, as a great saint. Or even by excellence as the man after God's own heart, faith in the man of a bigot is able to reverse. He reverses even the most simplest rules of morality and virtue. See, when you put King David, now listen to what he's going to say here right now. Religion encourages the most perver per perversion men to give themselves up to the blackest crimes of the most shameful vices and the most shocking irregularities by setting before them the examples of scoundrels who were nevertheless the friends of God. How many times did I hear people justify their actions and choices because, well, look at King David, he did something. King David paid a heavy price for the sin against the father and doing against Uriah and what he did. In this assertion, we may detect two deceptions. In the first, let's, we're talking about Paul now. In the first place, Paul was not a Pharisee. At the moment when he spoke, he was a Christian. Now think about this. This is when he stood before the council. He was an apostle. He preached Jesus Christ. He labored effectively, uh, yeah, effectively to make proselytes to his set. He had disgusted the Jews in announcing to them a new law contrary to that of Moses. He had procured, procured in the Council of Jerusalem the abolishment of the practice of circumcision so strictly ordained by the law. In a word, he preached Christianity and not Judaism in the same moment that he declared himself a Pharisee. See, when he was looking up and realized, hey, there's half Pharisee and half Sadducee. I'm a Pharisee. I'm a Sadducee. No, you are a, you're supposed to be a Christian. You're supposed to give it up. No place in Acts or any of his writings did I ever hear him completely deny and denounce being a Pharisee. Okay, on this occasion, his conduct was in fact that of apostate. At least it cannot be denied that he contradicted himself as a coward. I never viewed that. See, when we're writing and I think about St. Paul, the greatest of the great, the best of the best, who has 13 books, or 12 books actually, Barnabas wrote Hebrews, has 12 books of the New Testament, one third of the New Testament, he must be the best of the best. No, he's a coward. 
who did not care to acknowledge his real belief in the presence of the council and who had recourse to outwit his judges. He's trying to outwit these people. He's not taking a stand as a martyr. In fact, the conduct of Paul on this occasion has no resemblance to that of a great number of martyrs who freely acknowledge themselves at the risk of their lives and boldly confess Jesus Christ in the presence of their persecutors and executioners. He gets before a group and he tries to get out of it. Okay, let's keep on going. Let's keep on this side. This guy is covering it, and pretty soon you're going to understand the conclusion. The presence of the high priest and the council so much imposed on Paul that he declared himself a Pharisee. Fear trembled, troubled his memory to such a degree that he forgot that he had acknowledged himself as a Christian, a missionary of Jesus up to the Gentiles in the presence of the people collected before the gate of the fortress who indignant at his discourse cried out, Away with such a fellow for, from the earth, for he is not fit that he should live. The Jews wanted to kill him because he was preaching against the law of God. Nothing then but theological severity can clear Paul from deception, apostasy, and cowardice on this occasion. In the second place, it was not true that it was because of the hope of the, another life and the resurrection of the dead that Paul was persecuted by the church. He was called before the Sanhedrin because it was for having preached a new doctrine contrary to the law of Moses. This great legislator has in no part taught us what we ought to believe concerning the resurrection of the dead or of an... Of a, another life chapter 16 there's one line in there that's that's incredible we are here ever we are however to admit this conduct in Paul he pretends to justify himself by the necessity of becoming all things to all men I used to think that was a, a positive thing no he's not he's double-minded chapter 17 Sorry, <clears throat> slow down here. But certify to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. This is Paul speaking. He's testifying. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Further on, he pro proves what he advances by saying, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb. You remember all these verses and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went to into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. But other apostles saw I none, save James the Lord's brother. Now that the things which I wrote upon unto you, behold, before God, I lie not. And I lost my point for that one. When I confirm flesh and blood. See, Paul, when you, oh, I know, when you and I read the Bible, we read three chapters of the Old Testament, two chapters of the New Testament, and Psalms and this. When you study subject by subject, I went through the book of Acts. I wrote down every single verse, every single event, who did it, who said it, when did it happen, and I completely made an outline of the events that Luke made and said this is what he was given to Theopolis the pagan judge that he was going to, that Paul was going to have to go before, see? So then I took Paul's letters and I went through and I systematically organized what he said and what he claimed. And two, a year and a half ago to two years ago, I discovered this very same thing. That he's inconsistent with what he says. 
But if Paul did not lie in what he related to the Gentiles, oh, Paul's, Paul's a super saint. He cannot lie. It is clear that the author of the Acts of Apostles, whom the Christian church regarded as inspired writer equal to Paul, has lied. Did Luke lie? See, we put the characters and authors in the Bible on pedestals and not our Heavenly Father. We have got to start going back to the Torah and the writings and the, the Old Testament and learning that. I've been washing my mind of Pauline doctrine because his character has proven to me that he is a liar and a wolf in sheep's clothing and he has his own gospel. Full-blown Pauline people know that he preached a totally different gospel than what, what Yeshua did. In fact, in the ninth chapter of Acts, it is said that Paul, after his conversion and after having recovered his sight, remained some days with the disciples who were at Damascus, which proves that he was instructed by men and that he took counsel of flesh and blood. Believing himself sufficiently fortified in his theology by Ananias. Remember Ananias? Nobody knows who Ananias is. That word is used many times. There's many different people with the word Ananias. Or others, he began to preach Christ in the synagogue, at which conduct the Jews were shocked that they sought to take away his life, of which he escaped. For years and years and years, the church taught me that the Jews were wrong. No, the Jews were following Yahweh's words. This man blasphemed against the Heavenly Father. He blasphemed against the, uh, the, the law of the Lord. That is eternal laws. They were in the right to kill him. But because of my blindness, my bigotus, bigotry, of viewing him as my Mr. Sainthood that I was taught, I couldn't see what was being said. But even, support, even supposing that the journey and sojourner of three years in Arabia really took place, so you, you get, what, what do you trust of Paul? What can you trust? It would be no less certain that Paul took a false oath to the Galatians or that the author of Acts is deceived. Now we're getting to the last good part. If Paul and, and if fact, Paul writes that at the end of three years he returned to Jerusalem to visit Peter and he remained 15 days with him without seeing any of their apostles. Our saint Paul contradicts all this by a different tale which he confirms by an oath. Four times Paul says I do not lie. Anyway, let me keep going here. In relating to them, his conversion, he says to them, whereupon, O King Agrippa, he's under oath right now. He is standing before King Agrippa. He's not supposed to be lying. I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them Damas at Damascus and at Jerusalem and through all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meant for repentance. Who was that he quoting? He was quoting John the Baptist. See, the guy says you're saved by grace through faith and not by works lest any man should boast. And he turns around and tells King Agrippi that they should repent and turn to God and do works for repentance. It's in front of my face all these years, but because I'm a bigot and I look and I lift all these people up thinking they can do no wrong. No wonder people are blind. No wonder there is a famine of Yahweh's word in the church. The church is so heartfelt, loving each other that they forget about our Heavenly Father. You forget about our Heavenly Father. Chapter 8. <clears throat> Christians think themselves obligated to believe in the miracles of our great apostle. This is what Yeshua warned us about. Signs and wonders. You do not go by signs and wonders. In fact, like all performing prodigy, prod, prodigies, this is the most certain method of exciting the admiration of the vulgar. In 
capable of reasoning, of judging, of soundness of doctrine, and frequently unable to at least to comprehend it. Miracles always become the most powerful of arguments. Look at all the things Paul did. Paul says, if you look in the original texts, he had an angel of Satan. And his Jesus, the false Jesus, said, no, I will not take it out. He tried three times. Oh, was I deceived. Because of the science wonder. They are indubitably, 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 proofs that he who works them is the favor of the divinity. The consequences he cannot be in, or that consequently he cannot be in the wrong, nor capable of a wish to deceive. He who works them in the favorite of the divinity. Divinity, that's what it says, divinity. When you see signs and wonders, Satan can come as an angel of light. Satan can do all kinds of things. The best way to destroy Christianity is to give them a false Christianity of signs and wonders and greatness. And we just have to believe. We just have to love each other. We just have to do all this stuff. Father says, no, you keep my commandments. My commandments, my covenant is eternal. But if you get a chance to get this book, you can always email me or ask where did you get it or what. It was on a, on a, whatever we call it, um, Goo, uh, you know, the thing there, Amazon. It's on Amazon. But I'll tell you people, this was like, I wanted to jump out of my socks because it's like, all this time I've been struggling. I have people that hate me. I have people that I've been trying to be honest with. I've been trying to share people, get them to open up. And it's like, he's saying it right there. Your eyes are blind because you want to believe people. You love people, your emotions, your affections, everything in your guts says this guy is right. Even though he's preaching the false thing that's contrary to Yeshua. He's doing signs and wonders. He's doing all these great things. I don't know how many years I prayed for the gift of tongues. Why? Because that's what I, they said is the peak of whateverness, you know? Yet there's three times when the tongues was spoken and Yahweh, our, my Heavenly Father, completely His Spirit gave me utterance. I knew exactly what was said. It was for me. It was specific. He knew I would know it was from Him because I recognized it. Share this video with people, guys. I know I can't read right. I know I can't pronounce names very good. But our Heavenly Father is serious. I believe this is the end times. I might have 10 years to live or 20 years. Who knows? It's the end times for a lot of people. And so many people so look up to Paul, they believe everything. He's the test that's in the Bible. He's the leaven that Jesus warned us of. People, we got to take and be gentle with others. But what I see is the people who are willing to question are the ones who really love our Heavenly Father. They really, really want to know the truth. They want to search it out. I always want to know the truth. People, oh my goodness, the other guy, several people in the last time of this other thing said, oh, how are you coming with the commandments? How? It's like you have no concept of the commandments. You have no concept of the beauty of the law. Abstaining from unclean foods, keeping the Sabbath, and like the two basic things our Heavenly Father, these are the basics. And then the covenant of the Ten Commandments, it talks about in that, I'm going to do a writing on that. People, we, I want you to be encouraged, because I'm breaking out of my bigotry. I'm breaking out of signs and wonders. I'm living and learning the truth of my Heavenly Father. Just like you are. Just like the rest of us. All of us who are the remnants the, out here in the lonely villa of the cornfields and bean fields and stuff. I hope I'm not leaking here. Father Yahweh, I am so glad that even in 1700 you were trying to reach people. 
that you were trying to speak through people, but we're all labeled as heretics. We're labeled as psychos or weirdos or something. Oh, Heavenly Father, I just pray that you'll help people to see their bigotry. Oh, and I forgot to do the definition of a bigotry. It's with a whoredom bias that we consciously adhere to. It's a bias. It's a believing in somebody and not our Heavenly Father. Yahweh. He's the only true God in Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Father, thank you. Please let your spirit work in our lives. Please let this video somehow reach people's hearts. Help them to see that you are the only reason for eternal life. Is to know you. Is to know you. To seek you and to love you with all our hearts, all our might, and all our strength. In Yeshua's name, amen.